members to the ministerial statement. I have received notice from the Finance Minister that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I may members that in light of social distancing being observed by all the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or table, uh, speaker's table directly. I remain members to be concise in asking their questions. I also remain members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order are not normally taken during a statement or the question period after. And I call the Minister of Finance. Minister. Uh, I wish to update the House on the Executive's agreement to a draft budget for 2021-22. Members will know the Executive cannot set its budget without a funding envelope being set by a Treasury spending review. I had hoped that the Executive's budget would be set last summer and that it would be, provide a multi-year settlement. This would have provided the Executive with sufficient time to reprioritise plan and to consult with the public. However, the spent review outcome was not announced until the 25th of November, and it only provides a single-year budget. In these circumstances, I, drafted a, I tabled a draft budget for the Executive's meeting on the 10th of December, which largely rolled over the Department's existing baselines for another year. Unfortunately, it was not until today that that paper was allowed onto the Executive agenda for decision. This delay has further shortened the time available for consultation. Excluding the funding provided for COVID, the spending review outcome provided a broadly flat cash position for normal departmental spending once one-off funding for public services in 2020-21 has been factored in. It is this spending review outcome that forms the basis of the draft budget I am announcing today. The spending review has not delivered the level of support that is required to kick-start an economic recovery in the context of COVID-19 and Brexit. The outcome reflects an effective flatlining of our 2020-21 budget position. With increased demands on public services and taking account of inflation, it will be a challenge merely to deliver existing services at their current levels. Make no mistake, this spending review outcome has led to a very difficult budget, budget settlement for all departments. The Executive has, of course, the option to increase revenue through regional rates, but in recognition of the impact that COVID-19 has had on jobs, households, we are freezing the regional rate both for domestic and non-domestic customers. I would call on councils to consider taking the same approach when setting their district rates. Members will know that I am looking at how additional business rate support can be provided in 2021-22. In this difficult financial context, the Executive has prioritised allocations to continue welfare reform mitigations and to provide for Agenda for Change pay, supporting our health service staff. These allocations reflect the priority that the Executive places on protecting the vulnerable and supporting our frontline health and social care staff who have been at the cold face of the fight against the virus. We have also provided funding for pupils with special educational needs, reflecting the importance of this crucial stage in young people's lives. But I recognise that for most departments, the draft budget outcome represents flat cash settlement, which will mean effective reductions once increased costs and demands and services are taken into account. Choices will have to be made. Public services will have to be prioritised. If ministers want to start new programmes, they may have to stop others. Cancorla, I now want to turn to the capital budget. The draft budget sets out some $1.75 billion of capital spending, which will help deliver on the executive's flagship projects, including the A5, the A6, as well as the new mother and children's hospital. These capital allocations will enable investment in our infrastructure while supporting the construction sector. I can also announce that funding has been allocated to enable work to finally begin on Casement Park. More widely, this draft budget will also help to deliver key capital projects that will encourage investment and drive our economy, for example through investment in water infrastructure on the school's estate. The level of funding provided also delivers on the NDNA a priority to increase investment in social housing. This investment will help address high levels of housing need and stimulate the construction sector. Cancorda, people will want to know what the provision we have made for dealing with the impact of COVID-19 into the next financial year. The spending review provided £538.2 million of funding for COVID support in 2021-22. This compares to £3 billion in the current financial year. The Executive has allocated £380 million to the Department for Health for COVID-19 response and vaccine support, £30.6 million to the Department of Education to support families on low incomes through holiday hunger payments, 
and £0.7 million for the Department for the Economy for higher education places following the uncertainty that surrounded the A-level results this earlier last summer. The £126.9 million balance of our COVID funding will be held for further consideration as part of the final budget. Can Corla, due to legislative constraints, the executive budget is restricted to the amount set out by the Secretary of State and notified to the Assembly by my written ministerial statement on the 1st of December 2020. Unfortunately, the Secretary of State failed to confirm a number of previously agreed financial packages, and as a result, these cannot formally be allocated as part of this draft budget. This includes confidence and supply funding, city deals funding, and new decade, new approach funding, which come to £254.4 million in 2021 22. I hope that the Secretary of State will confirm these important funds in time for them to be incorporated into the final budget in the coming weeks. The Secretary of State has also yet to provide funding for the victim's pension, which his government designed and legislated for. Indeed, Mr Lewis has refused to even meet the first Deputy First and Justice Ministers and myself as Finance Minister to discuss the funding for the victim's pension payments. Cancorda, the Executive is fully committed to delivering these payments, and in line with the British Government's own statement of funding policy, it is the responsibility of the British Government to provide the necessary funding. I hope the Secretary of State will meet the Executive Ministers to discuss how the significant costs involved, which the Justice Minister has estimated may be as much as £800 million, will be funded. As part of the budget process, I am now commencing a period of consultation to help the Executive form a final budget before the new financial year. As a result of the delay in spending review, it is only possible to allow a short period for the consultation process, which, with replies due by the 25th of February 2021. Details of how to respond are available in the budget document, which accompanies this statement, and on the Department of Finance website. In conclusion, Concord, the budget seeks to protect key public services in a very challenging financial context. I hope that this one-year budget acts as a bridge to a multi-year budget, which allows the executive to properly reprioritise its spending and plan for the longer term. I commend this draft budget to the House. Thank you, and I call Steve Egan, chair of the committee, finance committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the minister for his statement and for meeting with me earlier today to discuss its contents. The Finance Committee considers that budget scrutiny is a primary foundation of good government that recognises the respective roles of both the executive in producing a draft budget and assembly committees in undertaking and exercising their scrutiny duties. Notwithstanding the unprecedented events arising from, this, from the pandemic this year, the Committee is very concerned that delays in progressing the draft budget will have a direct and very adverse impact on the scope for legitimate scrutiny and for engagement with key stakeholder groups. The Minister has indicated that the Executive received around $3 billion of COVID support from our nation's Treasury in the current year, and some of this money currently remains unspent. One of the questions I have for the Minister is, is there a danger that departments will be handing back COVID money in March? only to define themselves again with budget shortfalls in April. I also know the Minister is seeking flexibility from HM Treasury in respect to unspent COVID resources. Will the Minister be using this flexibility to fund a rate holiday for hard-pressed local businesses? Can I also advise the Minister that the Committee strongly supports the full take-up of the $200 million per annum of the available reinvestment and reform initiative borrowing? And can I ask him what measures he is bringing forward in order to make sure that departments make the best use of this cheap form of borrowing? And may I thank the Minister for his comments earlier on, but I have already started to engage with other committees as well to encourage their ministers to look at this money and also the likelihood of any underspends this year to make sure that money is not going back to the Treasury. Finally, there is obviously a lot of concern within the draft budget on no current provision for the victim's pension payments, the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. I know the Minister has already made an explanation of how he is, but bearing in mind that the courts have ruled that the executive was obliged to make this relevant provision in this budget, could he outline how we are going to get to this point? Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Thank you.
Well, I, I thank the Chair of the Committee for his, his comments uh, and the support that he has offered uh, me over the course of trying to get the, the, the budget paper uh, into the Executive and agreed, uh, and indeed the uh, conversation I had with the Committee last week uh, in relation to these matters. Uh, of course, there is a concern uh, in relation to the underspend uh, potential. Uh, we had £3 billion worth of COVID uh, money on top of the money that the departments already had to spend uh, over the course of the year, which is a significant challenge. Uh, and a lot of that COVID money came late in the year. Uh, and although we have allocated uh, uh, you know, the, the, the vast bulk of it, we, we actually received an additional £200 million just, I think, on Christmas Eve, or it wasn't a, a Christmas present from the Treasury, but uh, it was uh, just before Christmas. We broke for Christmas, and that added to the, the money uh, sitting there. Uh, and departments have been returning, beginning to return, and I intend to bring uh, January monitoring and COVID paper to the executive on Thursday. Uh, departments have begun to return uh, some uh, amounts that they fear they won't be able to spend. So, uh, as he uh, said, there are two ways to address this. Uh, one is that we encourage all of the departments to bring forward schemes and to redouble their efforts to make sure that whatever sectors are under their responsibility get the necessary support uh, that they require over the next uh, two and a half months. Uh, and also that we are lobbying very strongly uh, alongside both the finance ministers in Scotland and Wales with Treasury uh, to allow us the maximum amount of flexibility to carry over uh, some of that money into the new financial year. Because while we have uh, a significant proportion of money to spend now in this financial year, uh, our challenges really arise in the next financial year when we've been allocated, uh, as I have said, a, a flatline budget, which uh, in effect is a cut for some of the departments. And the COVID money that we have have allocated is only a small proportion of the COVID money that we have received this year. So we want to see that flexibility to carry over as much as we can to assist with some of the pressures that we are undoubtedly going to meet in the next financial year. In relation to RRI borrowing, of course, I have identified uh, that two departments have, have asked for £70 million each, the Department for Communities and the Department for Infrastructure, and I believe very much that that will help uh, in terms of the Department for Infrastructure, that very necessary water and sewage uh, work which will allow other development, not just public sector development, but private sector development as well, and stimulate uh, construction and development. Uh, and also then the Department for Communities, as we have said, have been an NDNA commitment to a significant house building programme. Uh, and I think this will help support uh, us meet that commitment. Uh, and I look forward to those projects being developed in full. That leaves an additional £60 million uh, of, of uh, RRI uh, borrowing which is accessible uh, over the course of this year. And I know a number of departments are interested and have expressed an interest in bringing forward some projects, the Department of Health, potentially the Department for Education as well. Uh, I look forward over the course of the period before we get to the final budget paper of engaging with those departments and their ministers in relation to that. The final question he raised was in relation to victims' pensions. I am, of course, very conscious of the findings of the court and the responsibility that we have to try and address this issue, not just in terms of that responsibility that the court has placed on it, but we have a responsibility to victims to try and find a solution to this. Uh, and as he will know, the government did change the agreement that we had collectively reached uh, in Stormont House. Uh, they drafted a new policy and legislated for it, and under their own funding, statement of funding, uh, that requires them to meet the costs. Uh, and we have not yet had a, an accurate final cost in relation to victims' pensions, but that top-level estimation of the Department of Justice is certainly something that would be well beyond the finances available to this executive over a number of years. Uh, and so we have tried diligently to get conversations with the Secretary of State to no avail. Uh, what I want to do in order to meet that uh, court requirement, but also to meet the requirements of victims, is to have this matter agreed before the final budget statement uh, comes to the House and, and goes to the executive, uh, so that we can get some certainty for victims in that. And, and we would hope uh, that the Secretary of State will uh, eventually commit to meet us. As I say, there was a, a joint meeting sought with the First Deputy First Minister, the Minister for Justice and myself. We haven't been able to get that meeting as yet. Uh, I also will be continue to talk to Treasury in relation to these matters because uh, they will also have an input. It's not just the Northern Ireland Office. Uh, and I, I, I think we, we want to see this matter addressed and resolved by the time we get to the final budget stage. And I call Paul Frew. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker Radical thought uh, seems to be non-existent uh, with regards to this budget. In a time of great challenge, we seem to be doing the same thing over and over again. So will the Minister ensure 
that the final budget will contain sufficient revenue allocation to promote economic recovery whenever this executive allows businesses to open and trade freely. And with regards to RRI borrowing, uh, the two departments that seem to be hit hardest in this time of challenge is health and education. Can the Minister give the, a commitment to this House that he will look seriously at RRI borrowing to both health and education? Well, can I say in terms of radical rethinking, uh, the funding that we had hoped to have announced in the summer didn't get announced until the 25th of November. We were told right through the course of the autumn that we were working on the basis that we were going to be into a multi-annual budget situation. We were told very abruptly at the end of November that it was a single-year budget. Uh, and that funding was then not confirmed for, for the 14 days by the Secretary of State as is required. So the ability to actually engage in a significant reprioritisation exercise was taken away from the executive because of the time scales involved. Uh, nonetheless, we do want to see economic recovery, and economic recovery is led, of course, by the Department for the Economy, but it's not solely the responsibility of the Department of the Economy. So the, the capital funds that we have found in relation to house building, the very necessary work to do that sewage and water treatment, which will underpin all sorts of development that might happen, both public and private, uh, are, are a significant contribution to construction which is about, makes up about 20 per cent of our economic activity. Uh, and so, of course, we want to support the Department of Economy in the time ahead, and we will do all we can uh, to do that uh, as well. But every department recognises that every single one of them are in a very difficult position as a consequence uh, of a budget we did not seek uh, and, and find uh, very unacceptable to us. Uh, in relation to our, our environment for both health, of course, I'm, I'm happy and willing. Uh, the departments, when we published the initial draft budget, who came back to us, where communities and infrastructure have said, well, we had significant capital bids which have not been met. Uh, we would like to uh, examine the possibility of, of using RRI borrowing, and we were able to do that with them. I'm currently doing a similar exercise with health, and we will do one with education uh, should it come forward with some projects. I call Jerry Kelly. <laughs> Or, uh, and I thank the Minister for the, the statement that he's made, and there's a lot to be welcomed in it. But in terms of the investment in the social housing that he mentioned, uh, could I ask the Minister how many homes uh, that he would anticipate being built uh, from that funding in, in the coming year? Well, I, th I thank the member for his question. I agree there are things to be welcomed in relation to this, but the overall picture is not good, as, as I've been very clear to members. And, and while I think we are able to find some good news in terms of how the executive will prioritise the limited resources available to us, uh, the picture is not one that we would have wanted. The, uh, the uh, figure for in relation, I, I'm told, is about 1,900, I think, uh, new house building. I, I just am trying to uh, find the figure for the Department of Communities. But I think it's in the region of 1,900 uh, new house builds that they intend to have over the course of next year. And of course, that's a very significant number, not just in terms of meeting the housing pressure, which is acute. And I understand, having listened to the Minister for Communities address the executive over the last number of weeks, that that pressure has built over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and the housing uh, stress has become more acute uh, at a more rapidly rising rate over the course of the pandemic, as I'm sure many other public services have as well. Uh, but also then in terms of that uh, construction and that uh, contribution to economic activity uh, that that level of construction uh, will cause then is also to be welcomed. Call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, whatever, uh, Minister, about um, food supplies being disrupted as a result of Brexit, I'm afraid this budget statement, draft budget, is, as he's acknowledged, pretty thin gruel. Um, the statement itself is fairly brief. Can I ask um, the Minister a couple of things? First, what is, his, what, is, what is the current picture in terms of underspend? Because that it's critical to understand, in a sense, what we're not spending this year in order to understand how bad we are, we'll be off next year. Secondly, um, in the draft budget actual document, which has been published online recently, it mentions a, and just under 70 million in terms of lost EU funding, but that's not in this statement on that, that I've seen. Could he confirm exactly how much of lost EU funding? I think that's particularly falling hard on Invest NI. Could he confirm that? There's a lot in here we need to study in more detail, particularly in the draft budget document, and I hope we have the opportunity to. But just the final thought in terms of lost opportunities. Sadly, we're squeezed very tight, as, you, as the Minister has said, but we are unfortunately finding two and a half million pounds to spend on Sammy Wilson's phantom flights. What an absolute disgrace. Is there no way we can address this man's absolutely ridiculous folly, Minister? 
Well, I, of course, in relation to the last point, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to look at the issue uh, of, of uh, the, that flights issue uh, in, in terms of particularly in, in relation to where we are now. But of course, he will know that connectivity is a key factor in terms of our own uh, economic recovery. In relation to EU funding, yes, uh, we haven't identified because the discussion in relation to some elements of EU funding, Brexit costs and other EU funding goes on uh, with, with Treasury. But in relation to the idea of the shared prosperity fund, which uh, the Department for the Economy would have drawn down uh, a significant amount of money, and I think the figure is around 70 million, I don't just have access to it now. Uh, I have to say that the letter I saw over the weekend from the uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury to the Scottish Finance Minister does not fill us with any degree of hope in that he confirmed the Treasury's intent, although we will continue to challenge that, both ourselves, Scotland and Wales, is to hold on to that European, that replacement European funding of, uh, he said, 1.5 billion uh, and allocate it centrally from Whitehall uh, and use it uh, to contribute to the levelling up fund, uh, which from my read is really about uh, channeling money into Northern English constituencies perhaps to try and hold on to them in terms of the seats that the Conservatives have won. Uh, so I think that paints a very poor picture for us here in relation to our access to EU funding, which we've lost, because of course he will understand that we had intended and, and understood that we would have that funding which we had previously experienced given to the executive to allocate against our own priorities. And it appears that Whitehall and the Treasury are set in a very different direction. So the, that's not in here because it's not finalised. Uh, and we will continue to fight that battle in relation to replacement of EU funding. Could you just say to members that we have a limited amount of time available to us, as is always the case in these circumstances, and whilst the Chair, Steve Egan, would have asked a number of questions, he is the Chair of the Committee, and that's why he would have been enabled, as the Chair are, are always given greater latitude. But I do want that to affect the rest of the members' contributions, so when people are asking multiple questions, they need to understand that the Minister is only obliged to answer one although the ministers normally try to answer as many as they can. But I'm trying to make sure as many members get speaking who want to speak. So but people limit their questions where they can. Thank you. Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I only have one question. Um, it is Blue Monday, and I am trying to be positive, but reading this draft budget, it's really, really hard. And a lot of that is because the UK government have welched on their commitments. This, these is a... Institutions were re-established about a year ago on the basis of commitments, and they're not being fulfilled. My question is in relation to rates relief. A lot of businesses throughout this pandemic have suffered really, really badly, and also Brexit is having an impact upon them. What consideration is being given towards rates relief in the next financial year for businesses, conscious of the fact that some of them will not be able to pay the non-domestic rates bills if they land in April? Yeah, and, uh I thank the member for his question. I'm conscious that the chair actually had asked me that as well, and I neglected to, to deal with it, and I was trying to go through the, the, the number of questions that he'd asked. Uh, but yes, uh, businesses have made it very clear to us that the, the one thing that they would like that would benefit local businesses, uh, small, medium and large, uh, the most is a continuation of the rates holiday that they experienced over, many of them experienced over the last 12 months. Uh, and we do want to carry forward, uh, and that's uh, some of the carry forward COVID money that we have bid for and argued for uh, will be intended to provide at least some level of rates relief into the next financial year and hopefully as much as we can possibly uh, possibly do because I do know for a lot of businesses they will just hopefully if the vaccination program rolls out and the pandemic begins to recede just be emerging in the new financial year back into trading again and we'll continue to struggle uh, with bills and rates is a particular bill uh, from all of our dialogue with the business community over the last year. It's the one measure that they have argued has had the most impact in terms of, of uh, providing them with a level of support to take that bill off the table for them. It's also assisted councils because it has given them a guarantee in terms of their rates income. So it's something we very much want to do and we have earmarked money to be set aside for into the next financial year to do that. And the earlier that we can give businesses that advice that that is what we intend to do then the more they can plan and budget for next year as well. I call Paula Bradley. 
Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his statement, and can I also welcome the phrase on the regional rate, and would agree with the Minister and encourage all councils um, to, to do the same with the district rate. Minister, um, I just want a further question of, of Mr Kelly had asked earlier, and we know that any investment in social housing should not only involve new builds, but the much-needed investment in our present stock, and we also have the added issue of the tar block strategy and people being displaced, especially in North Belfast, where there's not the land to build. So can I ask, Minister, if all of the money allocated is going to new build, will there be any other money be made available for those other much needed strands within housing? Well, there has been a substantial capital allocation to uh, the Department for Communities uh, for usage, and obviously it's, it's going to be up to the Minister to prioritise, and I'm sure the committee and the Chair will be in dialogue with her and her officials uh, in terms of the priorities they think they should be following. Uh, the, the additional £70 million, which we earmarked, was actually an unmet bid, so they are quite an ambitious capital programme for next year in communities, uh, and that's why we identified £70 million of RRI to try and contribute uh, towards that, and particularly to meet the NDNA commitment in relation to social housing. So uh, it will be up to the Minister of Communities to identify where the rest of our capital uh, budget will go, go once the final budget paper is agreed, uh, but I'm sure she would be considering issues such as you have raised. I call Gemma Dolan. Corlia, and I thank the Minister for his statement this evening. Um, Minister, the level of COVID funding reduces dramatically next year. So, given that some departments have returned money late um, in the year of carrying COVID money into the next financial year. Yeah, it, that, I mean, there, as I, t I was saying to the, in answer to the Chair earlier, uh, we have gone back to departments to try and ensure that they will spend out. Uh, first, we wanted an early return if that wasn't going to be the case. and We have had some returns, and I will be bringing a paper, as I said, to the executive in relation to January monitoring plus COVID. Uh, and the larger element of the underspend that we have is, is clearly in relation to COVID uh, allocation. So we want departments to come forward because there, there is still a very significant need out there uh, from businesses to communities to hospices to other sectors who still continue to have need. And, farming communities and others, uh, and we want to see can we allocate uh, more of that money ahead of the end of the financial year. But obviously we want also in recognition, of, particularly of the particular challenges in spending that out, but also the challenges because we have a poor budget uh, for next year to try and carry over as much as we can to try and ease pressures there. So it is a combination of both trying to spend out what is available and to carry over and seek as much flexibility from Treasury as we can possibly get to carry over money for next financial year. Call Jonathan Buckley. And again, this statement, like many of the Minister's statements, both past and indeed in the future, will be dominated by COVID-19 and the response. And while I welcome the £538 million in the next financial year, the reality is it falls far short of the £3 billion pledged last year. And I do support the call. I think it's essential that we allow the flexibility, and I support the, the call to the Treasury, in allowing for that flexibility to carry over into the next year. Uh, the Minister will know that the vital support for small business has been that rates relief. And I I welcome the call and support it in terms of the continuation of that. But equally, VAT has been a crucial support line for many of those businesses in the sectors affected. Can the Minister confirm, has he had any conversations with Treasury as to a continuation of that reduced uh, VAT rate? Well, the member is correct that that has been also a, a vital. It is not in this because it is not within our, our our remit, uh, our control. But yes, we continue to talk to Treasury in relation to all of the schemes that they do. The, the furlough scheme obviously was essential uh, for keeping uh, workers uh, paid over the course of this, uh, and the VAT scheme was uh, a great contributor to uh, an awful lot of businesses as well. So we will encourage uh, the furlough scheme has now gone up to the end of the financial year, which is, is good news, but we will encourage uh, Treasury to consider extending those. Uh, schemes and those protections that have been built in uh, on into the new financial year, and I hope we have some success in doing that. Martin Anderson. Um, Minister, we read last week that some of your ministerial colleagues was wanting you to address the EU shortfall by perhaps taking money out of other departments' budget. Now. Um, the irony in that, if it's true. But can I ask you, just listening to your response, are you saying that the Shared Prosperity Fund, the fund that Brexiteers had told us was going to replace all of the European funding, is not going to replace the European Social Fund, 
European Regional Development Fund, and therefore, have you had any further developments in terms of the replacement of EU funding for next year? Well, the, uh, the, the Shared Prosperity Fund may well replace the funding that came from Europe, but it won't replace it in the way that we were used to receiving it. Uh, and that's, that's a clear indication, particularly in the most recent communication from the Treasury to the Scottish Finance Minister, which was uh, shared with me over the weekend, that they intend, uh, and they have indicated this as part of the, the legislation that was passing through Westminster, that they intend to hold that fund centrally, and people would have to bid in. Uh, and now they've gone further and said they intend to use it as part of the levelling up process. And of course, the levelling up process, as, as announced by various uh, government ministers, including the Prime Minister, is really about the north of England. Uh, so I, I would think our chances of receiving the same allocations uh, first uh, across are going to be very limited. Secondly, those allocations are not set by the, prior, the executive against our priorities and the priorities uh, to suit the people that we represent here. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't believe that we're going to receive anything like uh, the same level of funding that this executive received and spent down through its departments as part of the EU funding we, we previously received. Now, uh, if we will continue to fight that battle, and if we can change Treasury's mind in relation to that, the executive has an agreed position that we want to access the funding that we previously got, and we want to be able to uh, allocate that, prioritise it, and distribute it uh, according to our own uh, uh, priorities as an executive. But uh, the Treasury seemed very intent on a different direction, one which I think will be damaging uh, to the people here, because we won't have access to that funding, which was absolutely vital over the years to supplement a lot of the budgets uh, that departments uh, had and to provide much needed support on the ground. Call Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, as has been mentioned, it would be unthinkable um, if those that were severely injured who have waited so long will now have to wait further again for a victim's payment. And given that your statement that you have said um, that the Secretary of State has refused to even meet uh, to discuss the funding for the victim's pension uh, payments and the affront that this must cause to those within that sector, um, has the funding uh, issue I mean, is there an opportunity to just move the ignorant Secretary of State out of the way and go directly to the British Prime Minister and get this issue sorted for that sector immediately? Well, the Secretary of State has been tasked with the responsibility of sorting this issue out. So, in the first instance, of course, we want to talk to him, but he, he isn't the British government. Uh, and uh, if needs be, I, I do talk to Treasury uh, on a regular basis, and we will continue to raise this on other issues where funding arrangements have not been finalised. Uh, and he's quite correct. This is uh, you know, adding to the, I suppose, the pain and anguish of victims to make sure when an issue such as this, uh, which seems like an unseemly squabble over finances, uh, is, is, you know, is not yet being resolved, even though the administration pieces have been put in by the executive mm -hmm. to make sure that the process could continue on. Uh, but it clearly does need to be resolved. And very clearly, uh, according to the estimates, and we have no official estimate or no figures attached to what the British government legislated for, uh, but according to some of the estimates that the Justice Department have, have brought forward, it would be beyond the scope of the executive, unless we were to actually reduce over the lifetime of the victim's pension, if it was against the high-level estimate the Department of Justice brought, we would be taking half a billion off the health service to try and match that. We would be taking £150 million off the Education Department over the lifetime of the scheme to try and match that. That clearly is not sustainable for the executive to continue to provide public services and do that. So I would hope that the Secretary of State will engage in time ahead. If he doesn't, I, I will be talking to other executive colleagues and be asking that we press whatever buttons we can to try and get this issue resolved in time for the final paper. Call Mike Nesbitt. This time last year, the newly appointed Health Minister was addressing the issues of nurses' pay and safe staffing levels. Now, I note the Minister says the Executive has prioritised allocations for agenda for pay uh, within the health service. But could he go further tonight, stand up and commit the funds to deliver on nurses' pay and on safe staffing levels, and to do so in a sustainable manner, uh, and not through non-recurring means such as monitoring rounds? Well, to do so would be to go into another department and to ask them to surrender money, because we, we are on the basis, as I've said, in relation to the government in London, uh, which was supported for nine years through its austerity policies to deliver them on us. We are supported uh, in, in doing that, who are, have got support from, from uh, elected members from this part of the world uh, to sustain themselves. 
have decided to give us a flat cash budget. So in order to meet increased demands in terms of pay, we would have to uh, take the consequential uh, resources of another department to do that. But what I can commit to, and what I have committed to the Health Minister, and I have had conversations with him recently, the money will be found to do those things. And the Executive is committed as part of this paper to find money for, for uh, safer, uh, safer staff uh, and those issues in relation to the Health Department. And the Health Department always has, has had, over the last number of years that I can remember, even prior to me being in the Executive in the Department of Finance, uh, has had a first call on monies throughout the year in recognition of the particular pressures that the Health Department faces. And that prioritisation of the Executive will continue into the new financial year, and these issues will be addressed. But they would be much better addressed if we had a, a government in London that did not continue to follow austerity policies in relation uh, to public finance pressures. Call Keeve Archibald. And I thank the Minister for his statement, although it is disappointing that the Executive has only been provided with a standstill budget. Um, I am particularly concerned by the Minister's statement that the spending review has not delivered the level of support required to kickstart an economic recovery. So can I ask the Minister if he agrees that given the economy will only be entering recovery mode next year, and that is of course dependent on the path of the pandemic, what is needed now is economic stimulus rather than a return to austerity, as he has just mentioned in his previous answer, and particularly so at a time when there is historically low borrowing rates. Yes, well, I, I think that we have to examine, in, in, in light of a very disappointing budget allocation, then we have to examine what additional measures we can have in order to try and kick-start uh, economic recovery and some of the RRI borrowing issues. And we will examine uh, ways to, to utilise the full level of RRI borrowing up to £200 million. Uh, of course, there is financial transaction capital. Uh, available to us, and we will be encouraging departments to come forward uh, with bids which would utilise all of that. So I think it is our responsibility to try and uh, utilise all that is at, at, uh, and we have an ability to access in order to try and support public services and kickstart economic growth coming out of the pandemic. That is going to be a challenge, uh, but nonetheless it is a challenge I think that we have to meet. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Speaker, um, and thank the Minister too for bringing this depressing document to us. Um, it is quite tough, but if I could ask you for clarification on a piece of detail. Included in Annex A, Table 2, there is a planned capital Dell of £28.4 million for fresh start for integrated shared education and shared housing. Given the comments made throughout the document about how disappointing the Secretary of State have, has been in coming forward, is there a risk that those somewhat 17 schools will not proceed if this money is the planned money? is not finally decided by the Secretary of State? Well, I don't have any reason to believe that that won't, commitment won't be met, uh, and it certainly will operate on the basis that it can and, and should and will uh, be met uh, by the Secretary of State. We did get recent uh, correspondence from Treasury in relation to the Struhl campus, which you know is a, a key shared education project for the Department of Education with uh, some clarity in terms of moving forward on that. Uh, so I think that, that is good news. But yes, we, we would want to have included these figures and should have been able to include these figures uh, from uh, the money that the NIO have authority over in our own budget. It did not come through in time to do that, but we, our intention is to have it cleared uh, and in the final paper. Call Philip McGuigan. Gurham Elgood, uh, Ken Collier. Uh, and Minister, uh, I have found some good news uh, within the, the pages of your statement and want to welcome that funding has been allocated to enable work to finally begin uh, in Casement Park. Uh, certainly that will be welcome news uh, for Gales uh, and County Antrim and right across Ulster and Ireland. And I certainly look forward to spending many days supporting my own club in Dunloy when it is built. Uh, but I mean, as others have said, uh, I mean, essentially, what you are proposing is a rollover of this year's budget into next year, and as you have said, it's a very difficult budget settlement for all the reasons that you have outlined. But can I ask, is it your intention to carry out a more strategic review of future budget uh, allocations? Well, if, it, if things had gone, and I accept the, the consequences of the COVID of the pandemic. Uh, in London as well as here. If things had gone according to plan this year, we would have had a comprehensive spent review over the summer, we would have had a multi-annual budget and we would have had a, a process to enable us to do uh, strategic and longer term thinking and, and prioritisation for the executive plans going over a number of years. Uh, but that did not happen. We ended up with an announcement at the end of November 
uh, confirmation in December and an annual budget scenario yet again. So, of course, over the course of next, this year coming, uh, the next financial year, uh, I think we want to plan again for that ability to, to set more strategic priorities. We have a five-party executive. We have the ability to have input from all uh, of the parties, with the exception here, of, of course, of the, the Green Party and PBP are not in the executive, but uh, it is, does allow for a broad approach in the executive to, to prioritise in a more strategic way of spending going forward. And I hope we are into a better budget scenario next financial, the financial year beyond next uh, and into a multi-annual budget to allow us to, to be able to do that. All right, Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the, the Minister for his statement. Like others, I, I feel it is very sparse and difficult to actually uh, uh, scrutinise it. Um, but I have noticed that the Scottish and the Welsh uh, governments have a degree of pre budget consultation, one starting in June and one in September. Uh, so, would the Minister accept it is very disappointing that he is here in his post a year? And he's announcing a largely flatline budget. There has not been detailed planning, scrutiny, prioritisation, and deciding how we should spend the money that is available to us. Well, can I say it's very hard to, to prioritise and plan how you spend money when you don't know how much you have, when you don't know over what time period you're spending that money, when you only get that announcement at the very end of November and it's only confirmed uh, on the 8th, 9th of December. Uh, and so I am disappointed with the budget outcome. I didn't campaign for the Tories to be in government. You did. And they brought austerity policy with them. You did nine years ago. You, conf, you might remember it, that uh, incarnation of the Ulster Unionists and the Tory party when David Cameron was over and you wanted to get him elected to replace Labour. And he brought with them nine years of austerity policies which continue to affect us. So I am disappointed by that outcome. So should you. But I never supported them in the first instance. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, 2021, Minister, will be a very important year for many in this community. It may not matter much to you, uh, but could I therefore ask, uh, given that this is the intended budget of the Government of Northern Ireland, how much does the Government of Northern Ireland intend to spend on the centenary and on projects for the centenary? Uh, can you tell us that? And Surely it's not nothing, just like the innocent victims of terrorism. What would that say about the alleged inclusiveness and outreach of this executive? Well, it, 2021 is an important year for me as well, because it represents 100 years of partition on the island. Uh, but of course, there are those who would like to celebrate that, uh, and the, the budgets for that will be included within the overall TEO spend. Call Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's very concerning this budget would uh, represent a uh, flat cash position and very disappointing that um, most departments will have to face effective reductions, as the Minister stated. It seems like the lessons of the last 10 years haven't been learned uh, to squeeze and cut services, which will be uh, ramped up if this goes ahead. What discussions has the Minister or his officials had with the Secretary of State around implementing the COVID wealth tax? To me, it is absolutely disgusting that billionaires have increased their wealth by £25 billion during this pandemic at the last count, likely more now, and we are asked to take crumbs to deliver our public services over the next next uh, number of years? Well, I, I share his opposition to the, the way policies are framed in London, and uh, we, we have always made clear uh, that is the case. Uh, the, of course, taxation matters are a matter for the Treasury, not the Secretary of State. Uh, and when we can't get a meeting with the Secretary of State in relation to victims, uh, I suppose it would be a bigger stretch to get a relation, uh, meeting in relation to taxation issues. Uh, but I think we, we continue to raise the unfairness of this approach, the unfairness of uh, deciding to cut public services uh, as in the first instance whenever there is any financial squeeze uh, comes on and spend vast amounts of money in other areas uh, which do not benefit people in their everyday lives. So we will continue to make those arguments for a fair allocation and a fair approach uh, to government spending uh, in London. Uh, but I have to say I, I do not have a huge amount of confidence given the government that is currently in position there that they will be fall on any uh, willing ears in relation to that. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. Moving to item six on the order paper, which is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Cornelia Margov. Thank you.